Hi, I'm Mauro Porcini, PepsiCo's Chief Design Officer. Join me for our new series where we dive into the minds of the greatest innovators of our time, with the goal of finding what drives them in their professional journey and in their personal life. Trying to uncover the universal truths that unite anyone attempting to have a meaningful impact in the world. This is In Your Shoes. Design is everywhere, but not everyone understands that. Our mission is to broaden people's understanding of good design and the value that it brings to society. Our mission is to normalize the design profession. I'm quoting our guest of today. He's the founder and director of MWC Productions. With over 30 years of experience in the television industry, he's a seasoned international producer and showrunner. With a long history of creating quality programming, for a variety of markets across the globe, primarily for the US, Australia, New Zealand, and Asia Pacific regions. Some of his many credits include being the executive producer of Big Brother, Australia Taste of a Traveler, Design Heroes, an international by design series of television shows, which include California by Design, New York by Design, Australia by Design, and Hotels by Design. Mike Chapman, welcome to In Your Shoes. Thank you, Mauro. Um, you're uh, you're one of my new friends here in New York. Um, been it's been a pleasure working with you over the the last few days filming this um, this interesting project. Yeah, that's how we met, right? I, you you are not from New York, as somebody can hear eventually from your accent. Where are you from, by the way? Before anything else? Yes, I'm an Australian. Guilty as charged. Um, <laughs> um, what city? What city? Uh, Melbourne's my home, yes. Um, grew up in Tasmania, actually, so if you don't know where that is, Google it, um, right down the bottom there. And uh, But I've lived um, a, a large part of my Australian life in in Melbourne. But, but a bit like you, Mauro, I'm a bit of an international guy, you know, a, a, a child of, of planet Earth. Yeah, what do you mean with that? What did you... You were born there in Australia. Australia is so far away from any other country. Yeah. Oh, just uh, I, the projects that I film over the over the time puts me in all corners of the planet, um, and in, you know quite a lot of work in New Zealand, which I know in America feels like is just like Australia, but but it isn't actually. <laughs> um, they they're quite different, and um, yeah, well, shooting this series in California, and of course now here I am in New York. Uh, I've filmed all over over the planet really and and actually you, you would know this people are people uh they might have um exotic accents like you um or uh not so exotic like me um <laughs> but um they all respond similarly to uh you know how we produce shows and i guess that's why formats uh there's a handful of formats that that really just go around the world you know that. Talking about formats, you you are very familiar. You were one of the importer of a very very famous format that actually changed television worldwide. You imported Big Brother to Australia, right? Yes, that's right. We were one of the early adopters. Uh, oh goodness me, you've brought that up. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> so that that feels like another time, another another me but, but what year yeah. was it when was it yeah it was 2001 I, I actually remember the last episode went to air it was like in the first week of September we didn't know at the time that September 11 was about to come along and change the world like the next week so Big Brother did feel like we were doing something significant um, it was a new kind of idea, a whole kind of what's this uh, reality TV concept, you know, where you just film what people do yeah. um, and sort it out in the edit suite. That, that was all pretty new and interesting. And, yes, Australia was one of the early adopters. We worked with the Dutch uh, where it all started and then uh, the UK producers. Um, and, um, and I think we were we may be next, Australia. So we we brought that that show on. It was, it was amazing, and, and I suppose really the only um, the only interesting thing I'd have to say about that because I, when I look back, I mean I'm I'm 54 now, but I, I was in my 30s then, and 
Um, it, it was an amazing human experiment and one that I look back at and think, hmm, not sure it was completely sound. But, uh, <laughs> but, but I did learn uh, from that show and many others I've produced um, some interesting techniques um, to get people to talk, to, to open up, to explore certain, um, you know, avenues of life. Um, I guess I like to think I use my skills these days for, for good, not evil. <laughs> <laughs> But you look, no matter what you may think of the format, the reality is that it was innovation. You know, you, you, oh, yeah. you said it, you said it right. You were experimenting and, and it must, it must have been very interesting to try something new that nobody ever did before. I mean, just in, in Holland, in the UK, but it was new for your region and new for many other countries around the world. And, and I'm sure there were things that were going very well and things were, that were not going eventually well because it was that new. Uh, the idea of failure when you try, you experiment. You, so what went well and what didn't go well, but eventually it was useful because you learned something on the journey. Yeah. Yes, well, I think um, Australians, Australians and Americans are very similar in many ways, but where perhaps they're different, um, and, it, and it's because Australia is a smaller country, we're, we're a lot more outward looking, but, but we look at other countries and we actually take on board a lot more um, what's worked and what hasn't, in, in, whereas America, I... I sense, I mean, I've been, I've been in America a bit, so I'm not just a, a loudmouth Australian with first impressions. You know, I, uh, I get Americans. Um, that it, it kind of feels like with America, if it hasn't happened in America, it hasn't happened. Um, <laughs> and that's, that's less so in Australia. So we worked with, uh, uh, with Big Brother, with the Dutch and, and uh, the UK guys and really took on some of their techniques. I remember... In the UK show, some people watching this might remember there was there was Nasty Nick. So Nasty Nick was a whole kind of incident in the UK show that kind of took over the UK for a few weeks. They they had to get um, uh, security guards in for poor old Nick, um, you know, because he couldn't. You know, people wanted to harm him basically because he'd uh, they'd painted him in the show as this this uh, manipulator and this backstabber and, and, and so on in the show. But um, th th that was actually a, a learned thing from the producers. And, and we, um, I feel awful saying this, um, we recreated that with uh, Johnny, his name was, in this, this unsuspecting character in, um, in the Australian Big Brother show, um, And we called him um, Johnny the Backstabber and Johnny Rotten. Um, so he was, um, I, I've met him since. We sort of had a good old laugh about it. Thank goodness he's kind of a robust sort of character, um, as I guess you would be if you put your hand up to be in Big Brother. Um, so, some would say you deserve what you get. But uh, <laughs> um, so th that was all, you know, learnt behaviour as producers. If you're filming someone 24 hours a day, they're going to say someone to some, something to somebody over here and then a few hours later say something to somebody else that if you put those two together, they kind of look like they're, um, uh, you know, backstabbing. It could be turned into backstabbing. It could be all. He's saying that, you know, there's just a slight innuendo here, a slight difference in, um, in how it's said, and, and then you put a bit of commentary around it as well from, um, because one of the shows, uh, one that I actually produced, because, you know, Big Brother's uh, made up of lots of different shows. There's the um, eviction show. There's the chat show on a Saturday night where we analyse what's going on in the week. So I was very much involved in the chat show, the Saturday night chat show. And so we, we got on uh, people to just talk about, look, if you look at this, on Wednesday he said this but, to Barbara, but on Tuesday to Sarah Marie he said this. You know, I, what's going on here? So then we bring on Johnny's brother that we fly in from Sydney to, you know, uh, discuss this. Is, is he, does he often do this? And uh, it's just, it's quite bad how, it, it's amazing how you can manipulate. 
Anyway, I, do we have to take keep it, it? It's painting a bad picture of me. I'm really not enjoying um, <laughs> this this past when I think about it. All I can say is I've. I've learned lots from that and other shows that I've produced. So, hey, why can't we talk about my exciting cooking shows, cooking and travel shows I've been around the world? <laughs> or why don't we talk about the design shows that you're producing? Ah. That is one of the key reasons why you are here with us today. So at a certain point, you decide to produce a show called By Design. Australia By Design and then California By Design, New York By Design, Hotel By Design. Why? Why a producer decides to produce a show about design? Yes, I guess uh, as TV producers, we're always looking for a niche, uh, a uh, perhaps underserviced area. Um, and uh, yes, it started with a, a guy, an architect, actually. I was talking to a guy who, who said there's, there's kind of highfalutin design shows that the... Um, you know, the black turtleneck um, latte sipping design community will seek out on Netflix or something, you know, on a, with, or with a glass of wine in hand, maybe, maybe someone like you, Mauro. Um, <laughs> uh, and then there's, <laughs> and then there's, um, then there's sort of down the other end of the scale, you've got your kind of HGTV um, let's, you know, bust into this house and renovate it in a week and then flip it. Um, you know, and they call that a design show, for goodness sake. Um, and I guess there's nothing in between. So I, I sort of felt like there's a, there's a space for a, a sort of design conversation that, that's accessible um, to the general public um, that, that to be had here, you know, to, to reach. Because uh, there's no denying it, if we can have a sensible uh, conversation about design in uh, to the the baseball crowd, if you will. Um, you know there's, that rises the tide. You know a rising tide floats all boats. Um, if we can rise the the tide on the design conversation just a bit, if uh, if that guy in the baseball crowd, I'll keep going with that. Um, if that guy in the baseball crowd, you know, eating his donut, uh, if you go up to him after he's watched one of our shows and, and ask what's good design, you know, just maybe he'll he'll have a couple of things to say. Um, and that and why why do you think that design will be relevant to that kind of target audience? What is interesting? Yeah, I kind of people. Mauro, of, of, of all people, you asking me that. Um, design. Well, I, I have my answer, obviously, but I'm asking <laughs> you. <laughs> Today you are the one talking. <laughs> yes. Design is everywhere, you know. Um, design is everywhere. It's um, it affects everything, you know. My, you know, iPhones, um, pens, cars. Um, Paper clips. I like everything. The <laughs> yes, <laughs> everything has been designed, and um, you know, if you if you start actually opening up your mind to that concept that actually somebody has thought about that, um, a bridge. I think if uh, I think people often think that a bridge is is something that engineers create, but um, uh, but no, you know they're. There's a designer. The bridges are designed by designers, um, and sure, there's engineers involved as well. Um, the line between engineers and designers is, uh, if, if done well, if done properly, um, is blurred, and that that's great. We we need that. Uh, the best engineers understand what designers are and and the value of them and work with them. So, so some of that is. I just think that's the beginnings. If you can get that guy to understand that, um, it, it just opens up everybody's mind. When he goes to to go purchase something, whatever that whatever that is, a new baseball bat or whatever it is, um, he can think. Well, hang on a minute. Has this been designed well? Um, and that just that just helps everybody, including, of course, it helps the design community. If, if people understand what what they do, I, I really like that idea. Essentially, you are creating a more 
broad critical mind in the masses so that when they interact with the products that surround them, they they can really understand them in a different way, in a better way, and eventually interact with them in a better way and eventually become part of the creation process. Because if they give us meaningful feedback, we as creative community, we can leverage those data, those feedback, those insights to create even better products for the society. Uh, exactly. I mean, there's a lot of ignorance out there. I think these these last few years have really shown us that. Um, we think we're sophisticated, but um, uh, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of dumb stuff going on out there. And um, I guess I'm just one little guy in one little corner um, trying to make a <laughs> just just trying to shed a little bit of light, you know, in, in, in one particular area. I, I must say, having started working with the design community, I, I've actually realised th through this process, I mean, I started the Australian version of this show, Australia by Design, uh, back in 2016. So I've been doing it a while now. And one thing that I've learned, I've called it TV producing all this time, but I'm actually a designer, as it turns out. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, I've, I have to think of the whole thing from beginning to end. It's afterlife, it's, you know, the show, the series. How is it funded? How is it? Uh, how do we put the whole thing together without going broke? Um, you know, because sure enough, you could, of course, you could make a most amazing thing with helicopter shots and um, and Brad, Brad Pitt in it, but um, but actually, that wouldn't be sustainable. So. Uh, oh, there is not Brad Pitt in the New York by the You told me there was. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I'm sorry. I, I, I may have lied to you. <laughs> um, yes, we, you know, everything is designed in, and, and in fact, TV shows are, uh, are totally designed, you know, for... And, uh, and uh, in for these few years of producing these shows, what did you learn from the stories that you have been producing, witnessing with the, from, the, from the designers you have been interacting with? Yes, I guess the way you've heard me talking just now, I before 2016 wouldn't have been so fluent about uh, about that. Um, so it's been a learning journey for me too. I've dealt with a lot of architects. We have an architectural version of the show, um, which I do hope to bring to um, America. We're starting with the innovation show, which I know we're going to talk about shortly. Um, which is which is more about um, industrial design, but uh, there's also other versions of the show. There's a there's a hotels by design. Now that's a glamorous show. I can see you on Marrow, um, poncing around fabulous hotels. <laughs> but uh, I, I have learned too that designers are very much um, they're kind of my uh, my peeps, if you will. You know, my tribe, uh, the design community are. Um, that we think very similarly, TV producers and designers. We've just got similar tensions that we're working with. It, it, just the end result's not a building or a or a. What widget. are those tensions? By the way, I agree completely. What, what are those tensions? Financial implications. Uh, the the audience that it's for, or the or the uh, the the end user that it's designed for. Um, how do you want them to respond, react? Um, how do you want it to be viewed? Um, because I'm well aware as a producer that everything we produce is is a document that's going to be brought back up again, a, a pretty much like you wanted to talk about Big Brother from 2001. Um, it, it's there forevermore. So it's, a, it's an historical document um, about design thinking and, and, and ways we go about. You know, in 500 years' time, they'll look back at what we produced and uh, think, geez, that Mauro's, uh, he's, a, he's a bit of all right, that guy on the TV. But uh, how interesting it, it was, what they were thinking. Look at their funny clothes, but look what they were thinking and, and how they, why buildings were built the way they were, what they had in mind at the time why a certain service uh, was created, you know, a certain app, um, what the purpose of it was. It, it's all one giant historical document. In, in a way, I'm, uh, I guess I'm kind of like the, um, you know, drawing um, pictures on the cave wall, you know, for future generations to, to see. So I take that quite seriously, actually. I, I think that's, 
I get a kick out of realizing that that's going to happen. So that's a similar tension to, say, an architect who's building a building who, who thinks, well, in 100 years' time, what are people going to think of this building? You know, what's it going to say about me as the, as the architect of the building? Um, all of that is what I'm thinking. Um, on a more practical level, there's, yes, there's financial implications. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, like paymasters or they might not be paying you money actually, but a whole bunch of people that believe in you who come along with you on the ride. You've almost started a cause, you know, like a, um, with, with a TV show and a whole bunch of people believe in that cause and come along with you, um, that's a massive responsibility as well. I don't know if that answers your question, but but maybe a designer looks at that and thinks, yeah, they, they are similar well, it, tensions. It, it does in many ways, because essentially you're saying that there is cost implications in what you do, but then you need to create a product with the best possible quality. This product needs to be understandable, accessible on one, on, on one side, but engaging and training on, on the other. And then this product has, has a purpose, like any brand. You know, you have a mission, you want to create something that is bigger than the product itself. And is the, the, the this, this idea, this dream that you have that I really love of creating something creating memories, you know, that will last forever in time. And then you're bringing people with you that believe in that dream and you don't want to let them down and disappoint them. It's exactly, you know, I, I'm, I'm saying this like, like if I knew what you're doing, even if I don't really know in details, because it's exactly the same thing we do as designers. So I, I yeah. totally agree with you. Totally, I, totally agree. With you. I, th I think you said it better than me. I wish I'd said it like that. <laughs> I just summarized what you what you were saying. <laughs> and, you know, talking about tensions, one of the tensions that we have as as innovators, designers, architects, anybody producing something, is the fact that on one side we're trying to create value for the world. On the other side, the very moments we produce something it has an impact on the environment, you know, a negative impact in, to, on the environment in a way or the other, the act of production, the distribution, the consumption, uh, the dismission. And so this is a tension and a problem we have as a creators community. In PepsiCo, we're investing a lot of resources to try to fix the sustainability problem created by the, the production of billions of products every every year. Uh, how important is sustainability in your shows? Uh, it's something that come out in the conversation, how, how relevant it is, you think, for both the designers, but also for the, your target audience, for the people that is going to watch the shows. Oh, my goodness. It's a running theme uh, more and more. When we started the series in 2016, it was, it was definitely there as a thought. A thought. Um, the design community were already uh, thinking about all that. But uh, now it's just inescapable, which, which is just so great. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, uh, I'm, uh, that's one thing I've forgotten. I, I, do, I do love that I've, I feel like we're adding to the solution by exposing good design people understanding what something that's going to end up in landfill and that's just that just can't happen anymore. Um, I love to hear that PepsiCo, you know, is, I mean, I can only do so much. I'm one man with my small team um, making a TV show. Um, PepsiCo with their little finger can do so much. So, it, it, you know, it's great that uh, you're able to do that. I, I think, I mean, my view is that um, every... Every company, little guys like me, big guys like PepsiCo, everybody has to be thinking that way now. That It's just not good enough to make a fast buck and uh, for whatever it is that you've made to end up in, um, uh, you know, in, in a landfill or we just can't do that anymore. You know, we've, I've, got a, I've got a bunch of kids um, from 28 down to five. But uh, my, <laughs> my five-year-old, um, wow, what a responsibility. You know, they're going to look very, uh, there's little eyes watching us, you know. Our generation, um, I know we're pretty hard on the baby boomers, but uh, I tell you what, we, this, is, this is our watch. 
right now. And those yeah. five-year-olds, um, you know, I, I don't want to be the sucky generation that, that didn't, you know, that knew what was going on and kind of, you know, did an O to what needs to happen but didn't really seize the ball by the horns. Uh, I don't want to be part of that. This, it's just, you know, it's, it's too serious. You see what's going on in California, what's going on in my country, in Australia, with the bushfires. I mean, that's, that's just crazy out of control now. We, we thought we had an understanding. We've got a couple of hundred years, uh, you know, with European settlement in Australia of understanding and working with bushfires and, and backburning every winter and all that. That's all gone out the window now. What we've been doing the last 200 years doesn't work anymore. Um, so, and, and we're in fact, uh, we're looking at our Indigenous folk who've been there for thousands of years and, and talking to them in a bit more detail about how they've managed it, uh, the, the bushfires because they've been around as a natural phenomenon. But, um, but anyway, same in California. That's, you know, year upon year, it, it, it's broken. We're, we're here. This is the moment of reckoning now. Um, yeah. So design, I mean, we've got to design our way out of this mess and um, designers we need and design thinking and innovation that's what's going to get us there. Yeah. And, I, and I look, and I think also that TV shows like yours and the media in general have an opportunity that is amazing to amplify the message. And it's a message also, you know, first of all, to the designers. So designers be as sustainable as possible in everything you do. But then that's not even, and, and to the companies, by the way, but that's not even enough. When these companies and these designers of the world produce the more sustainable products, we need them people to use them, to use them in the proper way, uh, to recycle them when, you know, the, the solution is to recycle them. Or if I think about our world, if we produce reusable bottles, you know, then we need people to reuse those bottles, to use those bottles in that way. So everybody has a role. It's an ecosystem where everybody has a role, the companies, the designers, the brands, the consumers or the users. And the media have a wonderful, once again, opportunity and, and probably even the responsibility to amplify the message as much as possible. So I, I really love the fact that you are leveraging this platform also to convey the message. Yeah, and, and other platforms as well. I'll tell you, but actually, I'll give you one snapshot, one sneak peek of one story in the uh, New York show um, we just shot the other day that's going to be in the series. Um, it's just so perfect. So this guy has created these um, bricks that uh, are made from compost from... Um, so, sorry, it starts with the compost, which grows mushrooms and corn um, and he's created the cob of the corn so not so the, the bit that ends up being thrown away in the cob uh, in the corn production um, mixed with mushrooms to make bricks so then the bricks are strong and interesting they can build buildings and so you can build a building out of these bricks and then uh, 60 70 80 100 years later when it's time to knock that building down uh, you could just crush those bricks up they go back into compost and then you grow more. Wow. You know, that's that's just like such a massive idea. I love that. Um, while we have the platform of, um, of, a, of a big audience, a primetime audience, like we do have on CBS, it's, it's amazing, we, uh, we, can, we can use that. I, I, I take that platform as being a very serious stage. So uh, we also try very hard to look at other, um, to represent other components, other causes along the way. You know, while the hood's up, um, if you will, why not address uh, women in design? You know, so we make sure, yeah. I mean, if we didn't try, um, if we didn't try, this show would be full of middle-aged white guys, basically. Um, so we, and of course that's not good enough. Um, so we, we make sure that we, uh, that we, that we have a strong representation of women. Uh, of course, the, um, diversity is, is another area that, uh, is, is so, so important and being escalated just of late as well. Um, so diversity in design, we, we seek out uh, to to address those issues too, because a lot of you know when it, for this version of the show for innovations, 
um, industrial design, if you will. It's it's kind of misunderstood as a concept. Um, so in this show, they get to learn that. And and what's more, an, an influencer of maybe little Johnny, who's 16, who's thinking, um, you know, what what is it that I want to be? I, I, I kind of want to be. I, I, it's sort of like architecture, but not really. I'm, I'm not sure that's quite my stick. Uh and then mum sees this show and says, hey, you know, you know, I think you want to be an industrial designer, you know. So, this is so, yeah. so true. There are so many people, both new generations, but also the professionals in the companies, in the business world that have no idea what design is. And the moment they find out, you know, I had this personal experience so many times, they find out and like, oh my God, I didn't know the design was that else I would have studied, you know, or if you are young enough, you're like, yes, that that's exactly what, what I want to do. And so that's another aspect of your show that I really love, the fact that we are creating that kind of awareness. Recently, we were working with, with my team on, on the diversity opportunity, uh, especially on the light of the recent events. And and one of the things we found out, for instance, in, in the United States, according to the census of AIGA, the Association of uh, Graphic Designers, of Brand Designers of, of America, uh, just 3% of the design population in the United States uh, is made by black designers. Just 3%. So one of the problems, yes, we need to search for them, hire them, give them a seat at the table. We need to do all of that. But if we really want to solve the problem in a sustainable way, in a permanent way, then we need to find ways to go to the schools, to go to the high schools and and even before and, and talk about design and explain people what design is and explain people how wonderful design is, how important it is, and the fact also that you can have a wonderful career also in design. So it's something eventually, if you love, you know, design, you can have a job and they can pay you for this and you can grow, you can have a lot of fun by doing this kind of job. So I the, this TV show is fantastic for that as well. I know. I, it's something I've learned. Uh, there's just so dynamic, exciting people in design and, you know, it, it beats working for a living, um, <laughs> you know, working in design, if you're passionate about it, pretty much the same as TV. If you're passionate about TV, you know, it's. A, I, I still think, I can't believe people pay me money to do this. So, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, and really, if you, you, know, you as they say, if you, um, if you love what you do, you'll never work a, a day of your life. And that's, I, I know that would be the same for, for you, Mauro, you're you're a real passion. I agree. I, yeah. you know, I, every other week, I'm like, you know, I can't believe really, you know, that people are paying me for doing something that is is really fun. And and you said it earlier, everything that surrounds us is is designed by somebody. So if people, the people on the street, start to understand that literally, you know, these headphones and this table and this lamp and anything, anything is designed by somebody. First of all, I think they're going to be interested on the story of that human being that designed that product that they use every day. So that that's already, you know, something interesting. The content is going to be interesting. But I'm pretty sure that a lot of people will be like, okay, I want to be that too. You know, I want to be that designer, that creator. I, 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 wanna, I wanna do that the same. And it must be really fun, and that's the story you, you're gonna you're telling through your shows. Exactly. On, on your point about uh, design schools and so on, um, we we try to work with the schools as well. So in the Californian show, California by Design, we worked with the Academy of Art in San Francisco there, and so we did some, some filming in the school as well. We actually uh, did a story on um, we produced a story on one of the. Uh, students there that was was doing this interesting project on on a on a car, um, but uh, something that I noticed is how many young women were in the classes, um, and also uh, at Parsons I was there um, talking with Tucker Weimeister, who's who's one of our judges in the in the show. He's he's yet another amazing fellow who's done so much. Um, but, but I was meeting him at Parsons there, and again, so in New York here, and again, uh, it, the classes were full of young women. So maybe 
maybe it's it's happening actually maybe the next wave is is coming and and, and there's going to be more of a balance yeah and i think what we need to figure out also is not just how to get them into the companies but also how to grow them inside the key leadership positions often the problem is not even having the, the enough women inside the organizations, but it's really giving them the opportunity to grow. And, and I think there is a mix of biases that stop, you know, women to have, from having the right career. But there are also things happening in the society that are actual real constraints. So as companies, governments, or and as, as communities and individuals and leaders, how can we help uh, women to have their career path and eventually combining that with other uh, personal journeys that they may have, like, you know, forming a family and having the kids and everything. So how can we play a role uh, at 360 degrees to really help women have the same kind of opportunity that men have in the, in any organization? That, yeah. That's really the, the challenge. Yeah, it's up to us, you know, Mauro. It's yeah. uh, as I said, I'm 54. Um, this is it. You know, where we've inherited the planet, we're kind of running countries. Our generation is running countries and making the decisions. Uh, we've got nowhere to hide. It's it's here and now. Anyway, yeah. I, I feel like you're doing your bit. I I sleep well at night because I do feel like I'm. I'm doing the best I can with with my little corner, as I said, which is producing TV shows. Yeah, um, no, we've it, all got to do our bit. It, it starts with us, right? With individuals. With each of us can do a little bit, and that little bit, uh, the summary of those multiple bits at the end can change literally the world. Talking uh, about a world that is changing, <laughs> we are still today, unfortunately, in the middle of a of a major transition, a major change, and mostly a major crisis, that is uh, this COVID-19 pandemic. How, how is it to produce a show in the middle of a pandemic? What kind of challenges did you, did you face? And and you think there are changes that are going to be permanent in the way you produce shows in the future, or you think you will go back to where you were before? Um, if you look at CaliforniaByDesign.com, if you go there, um, you'll see, you can see that series on that website. Um, that was shot in uh, early February in San Francisco, the judging was. Uh, and there they all were, jammed into a room at uh, Adobe um, Hig Campus in, in San Francisco, elbow to elbow. Um, judging the the, sh the stories in the show, and um, that's how we we'd done it up to then uh, in all our Australian shows as well, all the various versions of the show. Then then our uh, our mate the virus came along, and um, we we still needed our judges to to create these shows, so we, so we started the whole Zoom thing, and. Um, uh, there were lots of other examples of how that's been done really well. Uh, you know, the Democratic Convention, I think, was uh, that was a great example of, of a TV event done uh, in this way. And and so we've produced the uh, we've now produced a number of shows. The the hotel show I was talking about, where the judges are all on a big Zoom call. Uh, we actually have cameramen uh, filming them in their locations. You know, uh, exercising social distance as they do it. And that has meant we can pipe in any exotic judge from anywhere in the world into our our little, uh, our judging room, where, wherever that is. So, you know, we can get a, we can get Mauro Pacini from, um, from uh, New York and have him in the Australian show, you know, as a, as an international guest very easily. Um, so, I, that is something that I don't think um, we're going to change. I'm, I'm not so sure we're ever going to be back in a room again because it's just been so effective for our brand. Um, so that's that's kind of interesting. We had to to pivot or re respond, um, and and it's it's kind of become a gift for us. Um, meanwhile, on location, um, you've been out on location with us, Maro. It's it's uh, we're getting used to it. We're feeling our way. Um, the rules are kind of almost changing weekly in the way we film things. Some of the stories, uh, I wish uh, you know, if I could afford it, I might have 
I might have reshot them because uh, it wasn't perfect the way I want it to be. Um, and again, remember this platform. So there's lots of eyeballs watching us and people looking up to us about how to behave. Um, so I want to be part of that. I want to show, I want to demonstrate this is how you make a TV show in this time. You don't throw all the rules out because we're suddenly all Hollywood and, um, you know, the the virus is everywhere. Uh, so, yeah, it's a combination of um, we're kind of making up our rules along the way, um, looking at some guidelines that they are. I must say it's the Wild West out there. If you make a TV show and you Google, you know, what are the rules, you know, there's the New York State. They've actually done a very good job of, of trying to describe what their expectations are for TV crews. The Australians uh, have another approach again, which is very conservative. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what the, the correct answer is, but we've taken all that into account. Uh, we wear face masks in many scenes. I fight quite hard to not have our whole series with face masks because that starts to become quite boring TV and just kind of remind, you know, TV is also escapism. You know, you want to sit down with a glass of wine and watch a, a show. You don't want to be just con constantly reminded w what a rotten time it is <laughs> that we're in. So um, I try to, uh, I do, we're doing a lot more filming outside um, so we, we quite often manipulate scenes that maybe would have been inside to be outside instead. Um, I was watching an episode of 60 Minutes the other day on, on CBS and because um, I was thinking, what, you know, how are they doing it? They've got the same tensions as me, lots of eyeballs, and they, they kind of need to be seen as um, this is the A1 approach. It's 60 Minutes kind of thing. So uh, I was looking at them for, for clues as well and, and cues um, so uh, I found it quite good that we're, we're quite aligned with the stories that I saw and how they were filming them. That's pretty much how we're filming ours as well. I was filming with Debbie Millman yesterday and she, uh, you know, in a coffee break, she just, you, you know, Debbie, she's amazing and just so yeah. <laughs> out there. And she said, oh, my God, the my queen I... of the design podcast, the inventor of the design <laughs> podcast. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and she was like, Mike, oh, my God, I am so over this. I just want to go back to <laughs> where, <laughs> where we were um, as we were setting up another scene. And I was saying, well, Debbie, I don't think we, we you know, we better not be that close and uh, you know to the person we're interviewing and so on <laughs> so it's gonna be in the, in the show you know there are a lot of big names in the new york scene right that's right uh the design uh elite royalty you might say uh, have all got behind the show uh so so debbie millman uh you of course uh mauro Bacini, <laughs> and um uh, Stefan Zagmeister, um, you cannot ignore Karim Rashid, uh, Paula Schur. Oh, my God, it was amazing to uh, to meet her when I think of all the album covers she's done over her time. Michelle Rodgkind, you know, so we've got an architect in there. He's he's fantastic. Um, Tucker Weimeister. Um, oh, the list goes on. You know, we've got some interesting, um, uh, like, McKinsey um, agencies involved. Uh, Penser, some little guys. Scott Henderson, um, absolutely love love his guts. Scott Henderson and his passion oh, yeah. for design. Um, these are these are some of the people that have got behind the show. We're um, we're pretty thrilled. You, you were able to mix big big names and then also the emerging uh, designers and and really create the perfect blend. Because the New York at the end is this is a mix of very successful established creative people and then others that eventually come here and they want to change the world and they're growing and these cities is giving them an amazing opportunity as well. New York's that kind of town. Yes, <laughs> we don't want to just reflect the established, like those names I just suggested, I guess you'd say are. Um, I'm not sure they would like that. They wouldn't like to be known <laughs> as the establishment, would they? No. But uh, yeah, no, <laughs> they they fight against that. Uh, so yes, we've got some some uh, some younger up and coming uh, designers as well. And and, and Eileen Shaw is is another one. Um, uh, 
you know, who's, a, who's like a design curator as well, you know. So, so people who aren't necessarily designers as such, but they're around design. They're commentators, they're curators. Uh, they're all important for the, for the design community. And where can you find the show? If you want to show, see New York by Design, but also the previous shows, California, Australia, where, where can you find them? Yeah, so the Australian shows, our whole back catalogs there on australiabydesign.com.au. It's kind of like the, um, the American shows, but with kangaroos and, and didgeridoos. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, then there's californiabydesign.com, um, which, is a, which is another flavor again. And, um, and eventually newyorkbydesign.com, you'll be able to see all the episodes there. But uh, the first place you'll find it is on CBS. Uh, CBS2 in New York in the tri-state area. So um, with that, uh, I love saying this bit, Mauro, because uh, we're on prime time, um, Saturday, 7.30 p.m., starting 21st of November. For five weeks, we're on air. It's committed to, to, to design, prime time TV committed to the topic of design um, in uh, the tri-state area. So that's, that's pretty cool. We that's also, uh, we've also signed a deal recently with Amazon Prime. So, um, so look at us go. So um, all, everything I just said uh, from January 1 also is going to end up on uh, Amazon Prime uh, to a worldwide audience. So, yeah. That's we're doing- really, really phenomenal. Well, Mike, yeah. thanks so much, first of all, for being with us today, but mostly, mostly for everything you're doing for the design community to make sure that people all around the world understand what design is about, the value that design can bring and how beautiful of a profession it is. So I'm sure I'm talking on behalf of the entire community to really thank you for everything you're doing for for us. Thanks so much, Mauro. Really enjoyed working with you, by the way. I can't wait uh, to see you back on set for the next story. Me too, me too. (laughs) My first experience like this in television. Thank you, Mike. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha.